What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and in today's video, I'm gonna be showing y'all my favorite response, counter, refutation, whatever you wanna call it, against the tennis and gambit. How exactly is this reached? Well, usually it starts off by white playing e4 and then black going into the Scandinavian defense, moving this queen pawn up too putting immediate pressure on e4, and usually here, white will play a move like taking the pawn, knight c3, maybe even e5, but in the Tennyson, we see the crazy looking move, knight f3, and I do want to mention, this isn't the only way white can reach the Tennyson gambit. It could start off by white going with knight f3 with the king's Indian attack, and then black centralizing the pawn with d5, followed by white playing e4, transposing into the tennis and gambit. And I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. It's very easy for black to get into trouble, maybe even lose the game within the first 8 to 10 moves. So I thought I'd make this video to show you how to get out of this gambit alive. And not just get out alive, but get out with a guaranteed middle game advantage with increased development, activity of the pieces, and overall coordination in our attacking chances. We're actually going to start off with D takes E4, accepting the gambit, attacking the knight on F3, and 9 times out of 10, maybe even 99 times out of 100, you're going to see white play knight G5, attacking this pawn on E4. And really, white wants us to play a move like knight F6, and then continue to try to hold on to this pawn at all costs. But right now, we're up a pawn, and white just moved the knight twice in a row, to F3, to G5, and we're completely okay if white wants to move this knight a third time. So we're going to continue with e5, centralizing our e-pawn, attacking this knight. And the main option is taking this pawn on e4. But let's go over a move like d3. I must warn you guys, do not take this pawn on d3. Black is still technically better, but white gets some pretty good attacking chances by taking with this bishop, one move away from castling, attacking h7. We have future queen f3, maybe even queen h5 ideas. Black has to be extremely prepared. So what I recommend is just simply developing the pieces with a move like knight c6. If knight takes e4, we'll play f5 attacking that knight. And if d takes, e4 has ever played, we're going to take the queen on d1. I know some of you are probably wondering, why would we ever give up the queen at move 5 in the game? Well, the reason is that we have a big advantage. The white king can no longer castle, while ours can. And on top of that, it's our move. We have an advantage in development, and we're going to continue with a move like f6, getting rid of this knight, and following knight f3, playing bishop c5 immediately, attacking the pawn on f2. Now, if white wants to defend it with a move like bishop e3, we are completely okay with this. We're going to take this bishop and give white double isolated pawns, which we're going to attack for the rest of this game. And if white doesn't want bad pawn structure and plays a move like king e1, this only helps our advantage in development. We're going to continue with bishop e6, not allowing this bishop to come to c4, and following a move like knight c3, play castle and kingside. Now our rook on d8 is cutting all the way down to d1. And if a move like a3, stopping the threat of knight b4, attacking the pawn on c2, we can now play knight g7. And honestly, I just think black has a much better game. We're way ahead in development. We have a nice bishop pair on e6 and c5, two knights. This knight on c6 is probably about to jump into d4 a solid rook on d8, and on top of that, we could potentially form a battery ram on the d-file with moves like rook d7 and rook d8. I absolutely love black's game here. And if you look at this from the white perspective, it's very hard to develop, especially with a king that cannot castle, and I would take black here every single time. So following this e5 option, if you see a move like d3, don't take the pawn. It's completely fine. Just keep developing. There's really nothing white can do in the center of the board there besides take it with the knight, in which case we're going to play f5, or taking with the pawn, in which case we're going to play queen takes d1 and have a white king right in the center of the board. What if white takes the pawn on e4? Well, similarly, we're going to play f5, forcing this knight to make a fourth straight move, and we're going to have complete control of the center with these two pawns. Now really the white knight has two choices. It can't come to c5 because of our bishop, and it can't come to g5 because of our queen on d8. It could go to a square like c3, but by doing this, the knight on b1 is more or less stuck. I mean, we don't want to play a move like knight a3. As y'all have probably heard, the knight on the rim is dim. We want to put our knights towards the center of the board as much as we possibly can. And if the knight on b1 is stuck, so is this rook. So I think the best move here is probably just playing knight g3, in which case we're going to immediately play bishop e6. Now this move order would usually be a little strange. 
We usually don't want to play a move like f5 followed by bishop e6 because white would have knight g5 ideas, but the knight isn't on f3, but the very awkward square of g3. So this bishop has nothing to worry about, and really the reason we did this immediately is we don't want to allow white's bishop to c4. Here, if white continues with a move like knight c3, we're simply going to develop with knight f6. And if a move like bishop b5, which I actually think is white's best option, I mean the bishop could go to say d3, but then the d2 pawn would be blocked, and therefore this bishop, and therefore this rook, that would not be very good. The bishop could also come to e2, followed by a move like d3, but then the bishop would become a tall pawn. So I actually just think it's best for white to check the king, give us this c6 move, and then play bishop a4, looking to play bishop b3, trading off. And now we're not going to waste any time developing. We're going to play bishop c5, putting some pressure on this vulnerable pawn on f2, and now following a move like bishop b3. There's nothing to worry about. We don't need to take this bishop, weakening the f5 pawn. We'll simply play queen e7, and whenever white wants to take our bishop, that's completely fine. We're going to play queen takes e6, defending both of these pawns, which again is giving us a pretty good space advantage right in the center of the board, attacking this fifth rank, making it very hard for white to break through. And if a move like castle and kingside from white will simply castle, some may be worried about these f5 and e5 pawns being overexposed. But the truth is, both of these pawns are completely fine, as long as we continue with rook e8, followed by knight bd7. Both of these moves are developmental moves, and they really protect this pawn on e5, which is making things hard for white. It's hard for white to break through with a move like d4, because we have so much pressure on it, and it's hard for white to play a move like f4, because this king would have to go to h1 or f1 to allow that to happen, since it's pinned by the bishop on c5. Just like the last variation, I would take black here every single time. White just has a very hard game. This knight on g3 is very awkwardly placed. This bishop on c1, I suppose, could go to somewhere like g5 and try to trade off, but black just has much better attacking chances. We can play moves like g6, further strengthening our pawn on f5, followed by moves like king g7 and h6, just slowly expanding on the king side of the board. We also have knight g4 ideas teaming up on this f2 pawn with both our knight and our bishop on c5. We could also play moves like knight d5, centralizing the knight, and we can always move these rooks around. We can play rook a d8. We can form a battery ram here if we really want to. We could also play rook f8, followed by rook e8. There's just so much black can do here, and I would take black again every single time. If you'd like to learn how to play the Hippopotamus Defense, a strong chess opening for black, click the video to the left. If you'd like to explore more chess openings in general, click the playlist to the right. Leave a comment to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.